first time I ever heard about Chile Camp was when uh, your great uncle John went to Chile Camp uh, as a 13 year old boy when the camp was at Bear Lake. And at that time there was no girls camp. And he went for three years and then uh, that was the end of his camping experience. But one early spring in 1930, I believe it was 1933, uh, Daddy came home one night and said that Mr. Chili was in town and going to go show his movies at the Amarillo Country Club and he was taking, out, taking me out there to see him because I was going to camp that summer. Well, I was 15 years old and I wasn't the least bit interested in going to camp at that age and I said, oh, nobody goes to camp when they're 15. But Daddy said, well, you're going whether you want to go or not. And he said, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful place. And he said, this is a real financial sacrifice because this is right in the middle of the Depression. And he said, the 10 weeks of camp will cost $425. And uh, just be prepared because you're going to go. Well, we went out to the country club and met this little uh, round individual. Uh, Mr. Mr. Frank Chaley, and he showed his, his beautiful movies, and of course it never occurred to me to disagree with my father, so uh, when early June came along, here came a, almost a, a special car of Fort Worth and Denver, starting out in, in South Texas, and ending up on the Burlington, starting up from Dallas, picking up Chile campers from Texas, to go to Colorado. And we were met at the uh, uh, Denver station by Mr. Chile, who put us all on an old, uh, not it wasn't necessarily an old, but it was a big, big open bus owned by the Rocky Mountain uh, Transportation Company for no, no top. And the bus was absolutely full of Chile campers. Well, we drove up to uh, Estes Park, and part of the road wasn't even paved back in those days. And I think we went through the South St. Vrain that first summer, which ended up right at the edge of Chile. Uh, Chile Camp was right at the end of, of South St. Vrain, six miles southeast of uh, Estes Park. Well, we drove into this place that had these beautiful, beautiful, big, lodges uh, out of, built out of logs and went on up, there was, we first went, went to by, by the boys camp and the lodge there held the lodge and the boys dining room and then we went on down the road past the rifle range, girls rifle range and ended up at the girls big lodge. And I was, back in those days, there were campers there from 6 to 20. So the little girls camp, the little girls camp, which was called Lower Chapita, had little girls in it from 6 to 12. And the middle, uh, middle Chapita, Lower, had girls in it from 12 to 16. And senior camp, had girls in it from 16 to 20. Hard to believe that there were girls there 20 years old. And there were also campers in that little girls camp six years old. Well, at the, back in those days, the, uh, ca the cabins in Middle Chapita were held, had, had separate, had rooms. And each cabin had four rooms with two campers and a little separate room off to the side with, uh, for the counselor. And my, uh, my roommate was a beautiful, big, tall girl from Council Bluffs, Iowa, named Ann Winslow. And the other girls in the cabin, there were uh, six other girls, all of whom were from Ohio. And uh, I remember the names of some of them. One was Ann Cachat, who became a very good friend of mine, and another one named B. Hoagland. And uh, my counselor's name was Elizabeth Melbourne. 
I think I'm doing pretty good to remember the names of counselors for, uh, what is it, 71, eight, 70, 80, 81 years now. No, yes. 71 years. And the other girls were from Zanesville, Ohio. And one of them was named Ruth. And I'm sorry to say I don't remember the names of the other ones, but I think I did pretty good to remember the names of, of the rest of them. Well, back in those days, we had a little round pot-bellied stove in the middle of the cabin to give us some heat. Because uh, when the night came along in Estes Park, it was cold. Well, I remember the very first mountain, uh, uh, first pack trip. Well, it wasn't really a pack trip. It was an out camp. And we went down to Brainerd Lake, where we stayed in the Rocky Mountain uh, Mountaineers cabin. And it had a, one big room down in the bottom with a great big black coal stove and a loft across the top where we could go up and sleep on mattresses on the top of the cabin. And there were probably, oh, I would say, 20 girls along with our, with our out camp counselors. And our out camp counselor was named Marge Elliott. And our hiking counselor was a woman named Margaret Montagna, who we call Tex for some reason. But I also remember the, the first day, we got, our day we got to camp, they tried to get us used to the high altitude by a uh, hike. And we went on a, an indoctrination hike around camp, and I remember this girl carrying along with the, up, up above us with big long legs and a big black hat on and turned out to be a girl named Julie Menninger who turned out to be one of my very best friends and she was the daughter of Carl Menninger, the famous psychiatrist from uh, Topeka, Kansas. Well, she was a born hiker, but uh, that first that was the indoctrination hike. Well, our, our first trip down to Brainerd Lake was my first experience with mountain climbing. And we were to climb two camp, camp mountains that day in the Indian Peak Range. One of them was called Paiute and the other one was Pawnee. Well, we were coming back across Paiute and there was a long strip of, of snow and ice that we had to cross over. And Marge went along and kicked out steps across that. And as we started over, there was a girl right in front of me named Carmelita da Costa. And we got out there, and Carmelita's feet went out from under, and she went sliding down this snowbank, which was about, oh, I would say uh, 50 feet down this steep spoke slope. And she got to the bottom, and her feet hit this big boulder and just threw her over and she landed on her, thank goodness she landed on her backpack or it probably would have broken her back. Well I was right behind her and I'd never climbed a mountain before and I'd never been on snow like that before and I absolutely froze and I could not move. I was out in the middle of this thing and I couldn't go forward and I couldn't go backward and I just sat there. And finally the counselor came back and took me by the hand and got me off that mountain. And I'm surprised I ever climbed a mountain and get climbed again because it's, it really terrified me to see her go down that mountain. Well, I will say that Mr. Chile had so much to do when, uh, as far as, as activities for, were concerned, it was just unbelievable. He had silversmiths and from Kansas City to work in the uh, craft shop. He had woodworkers. He had all kinds of people. Painting, oil painting, watercolors, photography. Uh, there was a woman there from Honolulu who taught hula. There was another one from uh, uh, Kansas City. Not, well, she was from Missouri. I, I believe she was from Topeka also, who taught tap dancing. We had, uh, uh, later on, we had fencing, we had archery, we had 
riflery, a woman named Vivian Buser, who also became a lifelong long friend of mine who taught riflery. We have all kinds of water sports, canoeing, butterfly canoes, canoeing, uh, out camping, of course. We took the, the out camp trips all over Rocky Mountain National Park, which we could do back in those days. And we always used horses back in those days in the girls' camp because Mr. Cheeley thought that backpacking was not good for, for girls. They thought it was too, too strenuous for girls. So we had uh, backpack, uh, we had horses. And uh, well, I just cut, we, as I say, we had, we had, there was a swimming pool, but it was, and we would all swim if we could make ourselves do it. Because it, but it was very, very cold. And of course, the house for a horseback riding program was one of the uh, big programs. And at that time, Virginia Cheeley, the daughter of, of Mr. Cheeley, was just was our wrangler. And another, our assistant wrangler was a, a woman named Lois Smith from Amarillo. And the head wrangler. Uh, in the girls' camp was a woman named Lois Crane, and Lois was from Cheyenne, Wyoming. And that particular year, she was queen of the Big Cheyenne ro uh, Rodeo, which is at that time the biggest rodeo in the world. Calgary Rodeo caught up with it later, but that time, Cheyenne Rodeo was the biggest in the world. Well, we were all very impressed with Lois because she came down with her black cowboy boots, her big outfit and her white satin shirt, and ribbon across her chest that said Queen of the Rodeo and a great big white hat. And she bought some of the uh, cowboys who participated in the rodeo and some of the Indians and they put on a performance for us. And uh, it was very exciting and as a 15 year old we were all very impressed with Craney. And Craney again was one of the ones who remained a friend, a lifelong friend of mine. And uh, Craney's children, along with, with my children, later became campers, and their children. There are third generations, and now maybe possibly fourth generations of people attending Chile camp. Well, another thing that Mr. Chile did, he put on, he bought this woman from Cleveland, Ohio, who was accustomed to putting on big pageants. And so we had a big pageant there. And in the boys' camp, there was a man named Earl Meglin, who was the social director, who put on a menstrual show and then a big counselor show. And there was a, at night, Mr. Cheeley came over and told stories for us, and he brought in other people uh, to put on wonderful campfires for us. And one of them that lasted a long, well, a whole week, was a man put up by named Charlie Eagle Plume, who came over and put on, acted out the uh, story of two Indians, of, of two Indian stories, one called Queer Person, and I've forgotten what the other one was, but anyway, it was Ralph, his, his name was Hubbard, and he was the son of Ralph Hubbard. And Charlie Eagle Plume came over, and uh, he, he was an authority. He was part Indian. He was authority. And we were all, both girls and boys, were in the big lodge at the, at the girls' camp. And he would tell these stories when it was almost dark. And I'll never forget, he, he uh, had an Indian, he dressed like an Indian with, with the loincloth. He was nude, except for that loincloth, and he had a, a feather in his hat. And right in, right in the most tensest part of queer person, he climbed up on the big mantelpiece, and we couldn't see that he was up there. And he was up there on that big mantelpiece, and all of a sudden he leapt down with his yell, and everybody in camp just went went out in in uh, orbit. It scared us so. And this Mr. Cheeley came over uh, at least once a week and told us historical stories and Indian stories about that part of the camp, about that part of Colorado, and a part of it about Estes Park. 
and it was very historic, and there was a lake there called Mary's Lake, where the, uh, the Indians would come into that valley because it was very thick with wildlife in the, in, back in the, in the early days, and kill their meat for the winter. Well, the, I believe it was the Utes would wait until the Arapahoes had done the hunting and killing, and then they would come up and make a raid and try to kill them. And one year, the Arapahoes put their wives and their children on rafts and sent them out in Mary's Lake, and they had a big storm, and a whole bunch of them were drowned. And then there was a trail up over Trail Ridge called the Trail Where Women Walked, where they, the Indians would go across the top of the, of the Continental Divide over trail, what later became Trail Ridge, and the men would ride, and they'd also put their beef on the horses, and the women would go along and hold on to the tails of the horses to go up over this pass, which was this road, which was over 12,000 feet, and they called it the trail where the women walk. And that trail is still visible when you go across Trail Ridge Road. Well, uh, several times a, a week, we had wonderful campfire programs. Mr. Chile would come over and tell us stories of the early history, and especially the history of the Indians. And I might say that, that the camps were named for Indian women. I, well, men. Chapita was apparently an Arapaho or a Ute princess, I'm not sure which. And the boys' camp was Yaha. The, main, the big boys' camp was named Yaha. And uh, of course, the young, young boys' camp was Lower Sky High. And the middle boys' camp was named Sky High. Those were not Indian names, but the, the older boys' camp was named after an Indian. 